Our speaker tonight, Dr. Trita Parsi, is the executive director of the Quincy Institute uh, for Responsible Statecraft. It's a relatively new think tank on the Washington scene. <clears throat> uh, in his writings, Dr. Parsi has made it clear that he views American foreign policy as being overly militarized, uh, that it leads to endless wars against bad actors, and it's sort of like a search for military hegemony. Uh, Dr. Parsi maintains that the U.S. dominance that uh, in, in the Middle East, the military dominance in particular, has made the region the epicenter for what he calls the overreach of U.S. power. Uh, tonight, he's going to speak on this uh, subject uh, with a, a new wrinkle to it, in fact, uh, as of last week. Um, and his the title of his presentation is uh, The United States and the Middle East, A Marriage on the Rocks. <clears throat> his appearance tonight is uh, quite timely. Um, last week, China brokered the reopening of uh, diplomatic relations between two of the most hostile players in the region, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, some would call uh, the Chinese involvement there the dawn of a new era. But we have to ask whether China's arrival signifies an additional player uh, to the region, or does it signify the start of a divorce between the U.S. <clears throat> and the region, uh, or possibly both? Peter Parsi is known for his extensive writings on Iran and on uh, U.S.-Iran relations. He's, he was born in Iran, he spent his early years in Sweden, then he came to the U.S. where he got his Ph.D. from SAIS. <clears throat> so uh, let's hear about uh, the marriage on the rocks. Uh, Dr. Parsi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Roy, and thank you so much to Baltimore uh, Council on Foreign Relations. I'm delighted to be with you all. I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person, but I'm very grateful for all of you participating today to uh, uh, join us in what I hope will be a, a fruitful conversation about U.S. policy in the Middle East. I think it is an uncontested, and I would say also unproven, truth in Washington that the United States' military dominance and the need for U.S. military presence in the region, in the Middle East, is necessary in order to make America secure and in order to stabilize the region. This is essentially uh, the unquestioned uh, wisdom in Washington that rarely is scrutinized. It doesn't mean that there are not voices that are saying, hey, we should have slightly less military troops in the region, or uh, a lot of people outside of Washington saying that we should have far fewer troops in the region. But inside the foreign policy establishment in Washington, there is a fatigue with wars in the Middle East, but not necessarily with the idea that the United States should not be a dominant military player in the region. What I would like to do today is to give you an alternative perspective. First, make an assessment as to whether this truly has been helpful to the region and to the United States, why we have adopted this position, and if there are alternative ways, and if there's any evidence that if we don't pursue this path, are we truly going towards chaos in the region, or are there uh, uh, alternative outcomes that perhaps actually are even positive for us? Let me start by saying that the way we have defined our interest in the region has been extremely expansive. It goes from everything saying that we have to be there to make sure that the region is stable. So stability is an interest, which then justifies all kinds of measure in order to uh, regain stability. Obviously, oil has been a very, very important uh, interest of the United States in the region, support for Israel, uh, counterterrorism, but then we have a couple of other um, uh, or, or one other major interest that is essentially a catch-all for everything, which is we have to defend our allies. What we oftentimes forget about this is that actually the United States have very few, if any, treaty allies in the region. Qatar is a non-NATO major ally. Turkey is a NATO member, but we don't have such an agreement with Saudi Arabia, for instance. But when we talk about standing by our allies in Washington, we are discussing it as if we have treaty alliances with almost every uh, uh, partner that we have in the region, or even sub-partner, such as the Kurds, for instance, when Trump was 
uh, uh, pulling out of Syria. There was a lot of outrage, in my view, quite understandable that this ended up becoming um, a, a very dire situation for the Kurds. But we tended to forget we don't have an alliance. We don't have a treaty alliance with the Kurds. Uh, one could certainly make the argument that we had some moral obligation of handling it much better than we did. But we have blurred the lines of what it actually means to be an ally. It requires approval of the United States Senate. It goes through a specific process. It is not just something that happens overnight because we like a certain entity or because we have common interest on a few perhaps rather narrow issues. But when we say we have to defend our allies, it also means that their interest, however they have defined it, suddenly becomes our interest. And this is part of the reason why we have become so entangled in the Middle East, that we're involved in so many different conflicts, but we are taking sides in so many different conflicts or becoming part of those conflicts because of this idea that it is in our interests, it is an obligation of the United States to stand with allies, even countries that actually are technically not treaty allies of the United States. And all of this then falls under the umbrella of the belief that if we don't do this, if we're not having 19 military bases, 55,000 plus troops in the region, the region would fall apart. The only thing that truly stands in the way of chaos in the region is the United States upholding security in the Middle East and in the Persian Gulf. And if we withdraw, we will create a vacuum. That vacuum will be filled by bad actors, potentially bad actors in the region, such as uh, Iran or Iraq under Saddam Hussein, or outside actors, whether that would be China or Russia. As of late, it's mostly been focused on China. That if the United States were to withdraw from the region, though, that would be creating an opportunity for the Chinese to step in and fill that vacuum. So what has the resultant been of pursuing this policy? Uh, this belief that we have to have this military dominance in the region, 55,000 uh, uh, troops in the region on the normal day, we're talking about um, in, in the absence of major surges in Afghanistan, et cetera. Well, the track record is truly not particularly impressive, not for the United States, nor for the region. In 1998, the region suffered from five major military confrontations and wars. By 2020, that number was 22. This is all happening under the guise of American leadership and dominance in the region. And during a period in which America, for better or for worse, is the de facto hegemon of the region. Now, without a doubt, all of those different conflicts are not the fault of the United States in any way, shape, or form. Many of them are direct consequences of the US's invasion of Iraq, however. But as a hegemon, the key thing the United States needs to provide is security. And if we've gone from five to 22 during the course of American dominance in the region, that certainly is not an enviable record. Has it served US interests? Well, uh, it has as a result, uh, the, the dominance has led to endless wars. We have entered into these different wars without knowing exactly how to end them. When we finally end them, we end them in ways invariably or almost inevitably that are not particularly uh, favorable to the way we look on the international stage, such as the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I personally think it was the right thing to withdraw. But after 20 years of an occupation of that country, uh, it, it is a testament of our failure to do nation building in the Middle East that the outcome ended up becoming what it did, that there was such a chaos that the Taliban easily could just override the Kabul government. We had spent 20 years building up that government and it couldn't stand a week without active mil US military presence. We've spent more than $6.4 trillion up until 2018, probably quite a bit more by now, uh, on these different wars. Um, has it made the United States more safe? We can definitely argue that there hasn't been any major terrorist attacks on the US homeland from the Middle East since then. There's been a few, but nothing of the um, uh, caliber or, or the size of 9-11, of course. 
But is it because we occupied Afghanistan and went to war with Iraq that that is not the case? Uh, or is it because of other reasons? I would argue, I would cite uh, one of my colleagues at the Quincy Institute, Steve Simon, who's done a lot of work on this, that show that the true reason why we have successfully prevented uh, any major terrorist attacks on U.S. assault since 9-11 is because of excellent police work rather than uh, the invasion of or occupation of other countries far, far away. In fact, we have seen, I don't remember exact uh, statistics of it, but the number of people that were killed in the war on terror were roughly twice the number of people that were killed by terrorists between 2001 and 2017. That is also not a particularly impressive record, showing that what we're doing is um, uh, the argument that this is actually serving uh, the region as a, a whole. All of these different things have also then, of course, contributed to a tremendous war weariness in the American public. Uh, we see that being anti-war for the last presidential cycles is definitely the politically more favorable position to take. It's quite a contrast to early presidential elections, not necessarily that one had to be a warmonger, but one had to be very, very aggressive on defense. Now we can see that that clearly isn't the case. In the case of the Democrats' last presidential um, uh, primaries in, in 2000 uh, and 1920, it was fascinating to see that all of the original 19 or so candidates, with the exception of one or two, favored removing troops, U.S. troops from the Middle East, some going as far as saying that remove all of those troops. That is because overwhelming number of polls show that that is the popular position right now, that the American public has lost faith and, and belief that uh, a military president of that kind ultimately is good for the region or for the United States. Now, one of the interesting things that have happened in all of this over the course of the last couple of years is that as the United States started to signal in a more credible way that it is starting to think about withdrawal, then later on actually did a withdrawal. Uh, in the case of Trump, there was a specific instance in which uh, the Saudis expected the United States to come to their defense. Uh, and President Trump made it very clear that that attack that had took place, had taken place, was against Saudi Arabia, not the United States. And as a result, essentially uh, set aside the Carter Doctrine from 1980 that said that the United States would intervene militarily to defend the oil resources of the Persian Gulf. All of this have then created a situation in which we, for the first time now, can actually measure if the United States is not taking this forward-leaning role militarily in the region, will it lead to chaos? Will it lead to the type of vacuums that we were warned about? Or will it potentially bring about other type of phenomena, some of them that may actually be good for the United States? I would make the argument that what we, see, what we have seen in the last couple of years have shown a very fascinating uh, development that it completely contradicts the conventional thinking and predictions that were made in Washington. Let me go back to the specific incident that happened in 2019. The Trump administration had uh, adopted a policy of maximum pressure against Iran. As part of that, it was trying to do everything they could to make sure that Iran would not be able to sell its oil. Uh, the Trump administration was quite successful at many, uh, at times, pushing down Iran in all cities to less than a million barrels a day. Uh, the Iranian response for the first year of the U.S. pulling out of the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, and imposing those sanctions was to first stay in the deal, hoping that the Europeans would come in and replace the U.S. and U.S. trade, or, or making sure that European trade with Iran would continue despite the U.S. sanctions. Once it became clear that the Europeans were not succeeding in doing this, you saw more hardline elements in Iran uh, pursuing a different approach, which was to start inflicting a cost on the U.S. and on its partners in the region that were critical for the success of the maximum pressure strategy. So we saw a lot of attacks against tankers in the Persian Gulf, uh, mostly owned by the UAE. And then in September 2019, we saw an extremely daring and sophisticated attack against two major oil facilities in Saudi Arabia that for um, uh, uh, three weeks knocked out half of Saudi Arabia's oil production. This was a drone attack 
Overwhelmingly, people believe Iran was behind it. I too believe that Iran was behind it. Uh, but there's not been any conclusive evidence uh, that has been presented to uh, uh, to make that case. But nevertheless, uh, the assumption, and I think a rather safe assumption, that this is what the Iranians were doing. Now, the Saudis expected that as a result of this attack, the United States, in their view, would honor the Carter Doctrine and attack Iran in return because of its attack on Saudi Arabia and because specifically the attacks on oil fields in Saudi Arabia. That was not what Trump had in mind. He made it clear that he did not see this as an attack on the United States. He made it clear that the United States was not going to go to war with Iran on behalf of Saudi Arabia. This sent shockwaves throughout the region. The Saudi House, uh, 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 House of Saud was in, in complete disbelief, feeling betrayed by the United States. But then something interesting happened. For many years, the Saudis had refused any diplomatic engagement with Iran since the Iranians had ridiculously attacked and sacked the, the Saudi embassy in Tehran. The Saudis broke off relations had, and all the different efforts by the Iranians to restart negotiations with the Saudis, they had declined. One could, one could say understandably. But part of the reason why the Saudis also felt that they could decline uh, diplomacy with Iran was precisely because of the belief that the United States would have its back, that Saudi Arabia essentially had a carte blanche, that the United States was obligated to support Saudi Arabia in its military uh, campaign against Yemen, the Houthis in Yemen. Once it became clear that that wasn't the case, rather than leading to chaos that had been the predictions of uh, conventional wisdom in Washington, we actually saw something else happening. Quietly, the Emiratis began their own diplomacy with Iran. The Iraqis started facilitating communication between the Iranians and the Saudis. By 2020, six meetings were held at high levels between those two sides. Uh, in fact, when Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general, visited Baghdad, um, the day where, when um, Trump ordered his assassination, he was actually there, according to the Iraqi uh, prime minister, to give a response to the Iraqis, a response to a letter that the Saudis had sent the Iranians through the Iraqis. So he was there to deliver an Iranian response in what was an ongoing, quiet, but somewhat promising diplomacy between the Saudis uh, and the Iranians. Later on, all of this built up into what is called the Baghdad Dialogue, in which the Iraqis were actually facilitating diplomacy across the Persian Gulf, as well as uh, uh, diplomacy between the Turks and the Egyptians that mended their fa fences, and, and a narrative formed in the Middle East that precisely because everyone was now convinced that the U.S. actually was leaving the region militarily. Suddenly, for almost all of the actors, diplomacy became a more attractive option. When some states no longer could hide behind American military power, then diplomacy became the next best option. But as long as they could hide behind American military power, the preference was to pursue much more aggressive policies because the cost at the end of the day would be burden, would be shouldered by the United States. Would Saudi Arabia have invaded uh, Yemen in the first place, for instance, had it not been because their belief that the United States was obligated to come to their defense, which the U.S. did and continues to do to this day, even though there's been very, very clear voices from the Biden administration himself, including Biden himself during the campaign, saying that he wanted to end this erroneous war. So instead of seeing American military presence preventing chaos, what we saw or began to saw is that the military dominance of the United States inadvertently had actually prevented diplomacy, intra-regional diplomacy taking place between many of these different actors because their incentive structure had changed. If they could hide behind the military might of the U.S., that was a better option than engaging in what inevitably would be very painful compromises in a lengthy diplomatic process with uh, neighbors that they clearly otherwise are not particularly fond of. And what we're seeing now happening that was announced 
last Friday, I think is a further evidence that instead of the vacuum that we, we worried about the military vacuum if we withdrew forces, we were worried that the Chinese would step in because they would love to have military bases in the Persian Gulf. Instead, the Chinese filled up a completely different vacuum that was left by the United States, a vacuum that I don't personally believe should have been left by the United States. And that was a diplomatic vacuum. As a result of the United States getting so entangled in the conflicts of its partners, again, going back to how we define our interests, we have to defend them. Uh, we had played out our ability to actually be a force for peace and mediation in the region. Because we tend to take sides, end up becoming belligerents in many of these different conflicts, we are not seen, nor do we brand ourselves as impartial mediators. Take a look at the American posture on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're making it very clear, we're not impartial. There's an honesty in about it in, in that statement, of course, because we are clearly on the side of the Israelis. Same thing when it comes to between the Houthis uh, and, and the Saudis. We're not impartial. We're not trying to be impartial. But that has a cost. The cost is that increasingly we're not looked upon as fair mediators that have the ability to bring about an end to various conflicts. And then suddenly something happened that very few of us expected. And I would count the White House in that group and myself in that group. The Chinese stepped in to fill the vacuum, but it wasn't the military vacuum. It was a diplomatic vacuum. And they took off where the, where the Iraqis and the Omanis had left it between the Iranians and the Saudis. The Iraqis and the Omanis had led and done the groundwork for the mediation between Iran and Saudi Arabia, but it was the Chinese that sealed the deal and moved it past the goal line. And they did so, they could do so precisely because they had, with great discipline, pursued a policy in which they did not take sides. They focused on their trade and diplomatic relations. They're a country that fascinatingly has excellent relations with Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Iran all at the same time. This had enabled them to be viewed as an impartial broker, as a fair mediator. And they stepped in, and to the surprise of many, myself included, they succeeded, and they have now put an end to seven and a half years of estrangement between the Saudis and the Iranians. The two sides have agreed not to interfere in each other's internal affairs, reopen diplomatic relations, and some of the most likely positive repercussions of this is that we're likely going to see positive movement in Yemen, potentially in Lebanon as well, and at a minimum, uh, a further stabilization of the Persian Gulf, which will have positive effects for the United States as well, uh, with oil prices and, and the risk premium on that uh, hopefully going down. If you listen to the White House, they're making it very clear. They view this as a positive development. I don't think they're thrilled about the credits that the Chinese are getting or the um, 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 uh, prestige it will potentially gain on the international stage. But ultimately, reduction of tensions is good for the United States. And I would uh, uh, commend the administration for being very clear about that and, 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 and uh, welcoming this development. But it raises the question, if the Chinese were able to do so, and we thought that our only way of having influence is by having all of these troops in the region and pursuing such a militarized foreign policy where our main export to these countries is security, weapon systems, military training, et cetera. The Chinese pull this off without a single base, in fact, a single soldier in the Persian Gulf. They pulled it off because they pursued uh, an independent, impartial approach, whereas we, have, whereas we have deliberately pursued the opposite. Now, I personally, again, want to say, I don't think that's a problem. We should be happy that the Chinese pull this off. We should also be happy if other countries are now feeling that they have a stake in stability and as a result want to contribute towards stability so that all of that burden doesn't fall on American shoulders. But I do worry that if this becomes the norm in which countries, not just in the region, but perhaps elsewhere as well, look at China in order to be able to come to a conclusion on conflicts, resolving conflicts for mediation, impartial and fair mediation. And they look at the United States solely 
to buy weapons and weapon systems and things of that nature. I think that ultimately will be a very detrimental development for the United States, whereas we, we will truly lose some of the very valuable qualities that we have had historically and the role that we historically have been able to play in many different regions prior to us, making it such a critical point that we needed to dominate regions militarily in order to make them and ourselves safe. I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you so much. Do you really see a marriage on the rocks here? Uh, and a, a, is it a portentous of a divorce coming uh, and, and maybe a, a new partner? Or is, is, is this just a development whose, whose uh, outcome we really don't uh, know yet? I hope it's not a divorce. I think that the United States should have a very good relationship with many of the countries, as many as we can in the region. We should be on talking terms with everyone, even the ones that we strongly disagree with. The region is still a very important region. I think there are interests in the region that we still need to defend. Uh, uh, the flow of commerce and oil is still very important to us. Um, I think it's also important to make sure that there is no other state in the region that actually can take the role of a hegemon in the region. That could be a threat to our interests. Uh, but we don't need to have our own hegemony there in order to prevent others to join. We just need to have the ability of preventing anyone else. I'm not terribly worried about that because I don't see any other candidate that actually has the capacity of establishing hegemony. The Chinese neither have the interest nor the capacity. Uh, and there's no country inside the region, despite whatever ambitions or uh, uh, the way they self-identify, that have that capacity either which actually is very beneficial to us. We're not taking advantage of it, uh, but it is very beneficial to us. So I do hope that it's not a divorce, but I do also hope that we uh, take a, a moment to, uh, for some introspection to see how come we have ended up in this type of a relationship? How come, uh, are there not other ways that we can have good relations, protect our interests, benefit from relations in the region without all of these other things that we uh, have been doing for the last uh, couple of years. I think there is a need for a rebalancing of our relationship in the region and a rebalancing of how valuable or how vital we view this region. Uh, you know, for the last 20 or so years, we've treated it as if it's the most important region in the world. It clearly is not. We have shifted our gaze clearly towards Taiwan and China. But um, it doesn't mean that we have made the other corrections and adjustments that are needed. But a divorce, I certainly hope not. And I, I have to say, many of these countries that are welcoming a greater Chinese role are not doing so because they want to have bad relations with the United States. They're doing so because it lies in their interest to be able to have a balance between the U.S. and China. So the, uh, the flow of oil that uh, China is definitely benefiting from because it takes oil both from Iran <clears throat> and from Saudi Arabia uh, is, is going to continue probably under U.S. protection? Is that <laughs> Well, that's the thing. We are protecting oil that the Chinese are consuming and we're not consuming. We are subsidizing Chinese imports of oil from the Persian Gulf because we are spending a significant amount of money protecting that whereas we're not the ones consuming it ourselves. What's wrong with the idea that there should be other states involved, including mainly regional states, guaranteeing that security, and then pay the cost of that instead of that being on American shoulders? Uh, now that uh, the Saudis and the Iranians have agreed to at least talk to each other, autocrat to autocrat, is it possible that Israel, whose current leaders seem to be intent on creating their own form of, of theocracy, although somewhat milder, that they will find it useful to work possibly for a reduction of tensions with Tehran? Uh, I think it's a fascinating question. There's a premise in that question that I'm not uh, uh, in agreement with, which is to believe that countries develop relations or even close relations based on uh, their form of government and that the other country also has a similar form of government. Um, that's not the pattern we're seeing in the world. I know there's a, a significant focus on how democracies are dealing with each other. Uh, I think uh, we can go into that in, in greater detail later if you want, but the, the, uh, the democratic peace theory, the idea that democracies don't fight each other and they create peace. Um, Christopher Lane did a fantastic study on this and came to the conclusion that most likely the causality is the other right way around. Peace tends to lead to 
uh, the uh, formation of democracies rather than democracies creating peace. We simply have not had enough time with democracies to truly be able to test that proposition. Would it be better if all these countries were democracies? It would be fantastic. Uh, but the idea that they're talking to each other because they're poor autocracies or anything like that, I don't think is the factor. Uh, they're pursuing their interests. Uh, if they had pursued their interests a little bit more cleverly earlier on, they would probably have been talking to each other earlier on as well. Israel's position in all of this is an interesting one because it's the one country in the region that has explicitly been against this deal and view this deal as a negative. A big part of that, in my view, is because the Israelis, of course, want to see the Abram Accords go forward. And from their perspective and from the perspective of the Trump administration that put this thing together, there was a necessity to have bad relations between the Iranians and the Arabs in order to create a common geopolitical interest between the Israelis and the Arabs. Without that enmity between Saudi Arabia and Iran, Saudi Arabia's incentives to move closer to Israel, particularly mindful of the fact that the deal will do absolutely nothing to resolve the Palestinian issue would simply not be strong enough. So the greater the threat from Iran, the more Saudi Arabia would be inclined to normalize with Israel. If that threat is reduced, so will Saudi Arabia's interest in normalizing with Israel. In fact, in the document that Jared Kushner's organization released, uh, it explicitly says that an improvement of relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran would be a challenge to the Abrams Accord. That I think should raise some question marks about the very validity of the Abrams Accord itself. It's not really much of a peace deal if it only can exist if there is conflict elsewhere in the region. It's actually somewhat similar to how Israel and Iran's relations were back in the 1960s and 70s. That was also based to a large extent on a set of common enemies. Both sides felt very threatened by Arab states, particularly Iraq and Egypt under Nasser. And that was a key factor that drove those two non-Arab states closer together in, in a, into a, uh, a very sophisticated alliance that they had. But it was quite interesting to see in the 1970s, the Shah was uh, improving relations with Sadat. He credited himself for being able to pull Egypt out of the Soviet orbit. And this was deeply concerning to the Israelis because they felt, well, hold on, if Iran actually manages to improve relations with the Egyptians and improve relations with the other Arab states, it will then make Iran's relations with the Israelis uh, uh, expedient rather than strategic. I wrote a, a book on Iran and Israel, and in my interviews with the officials of the Shah at the time who were part of this decision making, one of them told me uh, very clearly, we didn't have Israel as a friend in order to have the Arabs as an enemy. If we had the opportunity to make friends with the Arabs, we would do so. And it's true that relations between Israel and Iran um, uh, were toned down a little bit, but the Shah never broke them with the Israelis. But it's, it's somewhat of a reverse situation right now in order for the Israelis to feel comfortable that Saudi Arabia will move closer to, to Israel. Iranian Arab enmity needs to be uh, there, it needs to be intense, it needs to be very threatening. And that's part of the reason why they don't seem to be comfortable with this deal. Uh, but other than that, uh, I, I personally don't think this is much of a threat to the Saudis. I suspect, uh, sorry, to the Israelis, I suspect that the Saudis are not closing the door for normalization with Israel, but they're in a better position from their standpoint and the type of concessions they want to get in order to do so by first having normalized with Iran and then waiting things out because the Saudis are in no rush to do so. Well, both Saudi Arabia and Israel have certainly wanted to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. <clears throat> so, um, and, and they had that in common and that made them allies in many ways, certainly in, in a security sense. Uh, so what happens now? I mean, what happens to the Iran nuclear deal, for example? Well, well, first of all, let's remind ourselves of one very important thing. The Saudis and the Iranians have signed a normalization agreement. It means that they will reopen their embassies. They've added a couple of other things, such as not interference in each other's affairs. That's it. There's no love affair between the Saudis and the Iranians. They're still rivals in the region. There's still massive amount of mistrust 
But what has been done is that a very important step has been taken in the direction of being able to de-escalate their tensions. And a mechanism has been put in place in order to be able to achieve that de-escalation. Whether they will de-escalate to the extent that I think many hope remains to be seen. But it's not a peace agreement in that sense. Uh, it is a normalization agreement, uh, which is good in and of itself is an important first step. But we should be very careful of thinking, you know, we, we're not seeing an Iranian-Saudi alliance in any way, shape or form right now. But we're seeing that the region has the capacity of resolving their own tensions. They don't need the United States for it necessarily. Uh, uh, and, and the outbreak of diplomacy that happened once these states started to think that the U.S. was leaving is an indication of at least uh, a, a recognition on these states of the direction they need to go. Uh, but when it comes to the nuclear deal itself, it's on ice right now. Um, uh, the Iranians messed up the last round of negotiations on this issue. A deal had been put forward that was very, very close uh, for full agreement. And last minute, the Iranians came in with some additional demands that just blew the whole thing up. And then um, uh, we were only weeks away from the midterms in, in the US. And of course, the protests began in Iran. And what that has done is that it has dramatically increased the political cost for the Biden administration to go forward with a nuclear deal right now. And then the other factor in all of this is really important is that the Iranians started supporting Russia in the war in Ukraine. That has been a devastating uh, uh, development from the perspective of the political cost the administration believes they will pay if they uh, normalize with Iran. But the way this normalization deal between, um, sorry, if they uh, uh, sign on to the JCPOA, but the way this normalization deal has an impact on the JCPOA is that as long as there was no active JCPOA, the US strategy was to just further isolate and sanction Iran in order to increase the cost for the Iranians not to come back in an agreement to the deal that was on the table, even though I don't think the US would even accept its own deal at this point because of uh, the situation in Ukraine. If the Saudis are normalizing, if they're normalizing their trade with Iran, it's gonna make it much more difficult to isolate the Iranians. Uh, and, and pressure their economy. They're still under tremendous pressure, but it's a blow to that effort. But I don't think it's gonna have a decisive impact one way or another on the JCPOA. The only thing that can really save the JCPOA is if the Iranians come back and agree to the deal that was on the table. And if the Biden administration decides that it's worth paying the political cost and get all the criticism they will get um, uh, from the critics of the deal, but it's better to do that than to actually see the Iranian nuclear program continue to expand as it currently is doing. Here's a question from Jeffrey Greif, <clears throat> uh, and, and it comes up another, another one that relates to Israel. Would a two-state solution be more possible if the United States receded from the region? Or, or is a two-state solution never going to happen? It's a great question. Um, and I don't know if receded is necessary, but I do believe that the U.S.'s role in this, unfortunately, has not um, in the past at least 15 or so years been particularly, or a little bit longer than that, particularly positive. Um, because the two-state solution essentially is dead, but we're all pretending that it's alive so that we avoid having to deal with the real crisis, which is that there's an ongoing occupation that is illegal, uh, that is in violation of international law. We're fighting for international law and the rules-based order in Ukraine, yet we are approving of it in Israel-Palestine. We're approving of it explicitly when it comes to the Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights. We violated our own position when we did the Abrams Accord and uh, uh, accepted Morocco's uh, occupation and annexation of Western Sahara. So unfortunately, I do believe that the position we have taken and our reluctance to put pressure on Israel, and in fact, our pressure right now on countries to normalize relations with Israel without the Israelis making any compromises with the Palestinians, without them moving towards making the two-state solution viable again, is ultimately really to the detriment of finding an, uh, a long-term solution uh, uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. As I mentioned earlier on, the Abrams Accord was explicit about moving beyond the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, essentially saying, just gonna brush it under the rug. And we've seen clearly now, based on the violence that is taking place, that that is not possible. It may have looked possible 
uh, during the height of the Arab Spring, where Arab focus was much more internal than towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But this issue is not going away. It's become more important. Um, um, and unfortunately, if we continue on the policy that we're pursuing right now, we will be co-responsible for making a two-state solution that was viable at one point, unviable, and probably an impossibility, if not already done so. Do you see China as, uh, which has, as you as you've pointed out, good relations with all three, Iran, Saudi, and Israel, um, playing some kind of a role? Is, is this conceivable? I, I would be shocked if the <laughs> Chinese, <laughs> I mean, it, it would be a, perhaps a sign of hubris. They had one success uh, and they now want to take on one of the biggest issues. Um, I would be surprised if they did so. But having said that, I was also surprised to see that in the last two years, it's been the Chinese that have introduced resolutions at the UN Security Council, together with the Norwegians, together with the New Zealanders, um, uh, condemning uh, illegal Israeli settlements on uh, Palestinian territory. Uh, in the past, the Chinese would obviously vote in favor of them, but they were now the ones introducing the resolutions, which was one step more, in, you know, getting deeper into the conflict. Mediation, again, I, I don't think they're ready for it. Um, I think they'll do other things before that. Uh, the question is, how long can this occupation go on without it becoming next to impossible uh, to truly look at a two-state solution and uh, have us be forced to look at other forms of solutions, whether there is as one confederate state or other type of um, 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 options that are being discussed in various places. Uh, here's a question from Donna Price, <laughs> pointing out uh, some realities of the cultural differences in the region. Given the historical enmity between Sunnis and Shia, and it really goes back a very long way, uh, how enduring do you imagine this new, newfound, she calls it a kumbaya feeling, uh, between Iran and the House of Saud uh, is, is likely to be? Well, first of all, there's no kumbaya. Let's, let's be very clear. This is an extremely important development, but it is no kumbaya. They have restored relations and they've decided not to interfere in each other's uh, internal affairs and hopefully will have other spillover effects in Lebanon, et cetera. But it's no kumbaya, not yet at least. In fact, the Chinese are gonna do another uh, summit in Beijing later this year in which they're gonna bring Iran and the six uh, Arab nations of the Persian Gulf and the GCC to Beijing for a summit which appears to be trying to lay the groundwork for a deeper um, um, reconciliation between the two sides. So it's a step towards a potential kumbaya, but we're not there. The other element of that question is, Yes, there are without a doubt tensions between Sunni and Shia, but it is also, and while it's true that those have deep historical roots, it is also true that that issue has not necessarily been the dominant issue uh, that has characterized the relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia or Iran or other Arab states for long periods of time, including in recent memory. Just about two we decades ago, there was a major thought in Saudi-Iranian relations that actually broke as a result of the Iraq invasion that rocked the balance in the region and the Iranians heavily benefited from it. And the Saudis heavily uh, 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 were set back by the invasion, uh, the US invasion of Iraq. But up until that point, there was a major thaw in uh, Saudi-Iranian relations and there were still Sunnis and Shias back then as well. So while it is a dimension, I think there's a tendency in the West to look through the region from the prism of religion, ideology, et cetera. And I think that has a tendency to give us the impression that these conflicts are far more intractable than they actually are. And it may have been a contributor to the belief that we have to be there, otherwise everything will be chaos. So here's a very interesting comment from one of our listeners. Uh, which brings a lot of things together. He suggests that, this is uh, Zev Lavon, he suggests that China is pursuing a long-term, like a 50 to 100 year vision, <laughs> while the United States is pursuing an election time policy of two to four years. 
Uh, China is less interested, but he says China is less interested in the stability of the Middle East than it is in uh, getting a local fo foothold that will allow them to navigate the next steps over over many years. <clears throat> over time, China will probably come to realize that the Middle East is a fractionated political, or rather religious, uh, uh, and I think political as well, quagmire. Uh, but it'll surely stay do its very best to stay away from any long local conflict. And, uh, the U U.S. has been uh, has has failed in building nations in the region. Uh, its military presence is uh, based on oil interests and stopping the Iranian religious expansion of influence. Um, uh, uh, so the question is, what is the next best move for the United States? That's a very long question. Well, it's a, <laughs> a comment. Of, I mean, just it's a comment. It's, it's a, a lot of interesting points in it. Um, let, let me comment on a couple of those points and then get to the question as well. Um, I do believe the Chinese are, are actually quite interested in stability in the region. Um, they're getting about 50% of their energy from uh, the Persian Gulf. Instability there, instability of the ship lines, instability in terms of adding um, um, uh, uh, risk premium to the price of oil, as well as the risk of a military strike against Iran. And as we've seen just in the last couple of weeks, the United States and Israel have been uh, conducting ever more large and directly aimed at Iran military exercises, um, clearly signaling that there is a military option that the U.S. and Israel are willing to use uh, if the Iranian nuclear program goes forward or continues to expand. Those are threats to the Chinese, without a doubt. You know, the Chinese are already having problem of, re, you know, sustaining the current level of growth, particularly after how they handled uh, COVID. Um, and this would be a, a major devastating development for the Chinese and their economy, which they're primarily concerned about. So I, I don't think that they're disinterested in it. I think it's important for them. Uh, I think you're right about having a foothold in the region, but that foothold is not a military foothold. It's a foothold of being able to tie these countries to China in such a way that if the confrontation between uh, China and the United States gets to a very bad situation and the U.S. does what it usually does, which is to go around the world and say, you have to take our side or their side, just as we're doing on Ukraine right now, that those countries will be able to resist that and continue to trade with China even though they will remain close friends of the U.S., and even though China and the U.S. will be in a very bad uh, uh, relation, uh, you know, in, in high tensions with each other. So in that sense, I think, you know, a foothold is is important for them, but not necessarily in the way that we have done things by building military uh, bases, et cetera. What should the U.S. do? Well, I, I think, I go back to what I said in my uh, presentation. First of all, I think it's essential for us to restore the JCPOA. That was the absolute best way of making sure that there is no nuclear weapon in Iran, which could really rattle things in the Middle East in a very negative way. We need to continue pursue a policy that actually puts ourselves on talking terms with everyone in the region, whether we agree with them, whether we like them, whether they're autocrats, Democrats does not matter. We're not talking to them because we like talking to them. We are talking to them because it's in our interest to be able to maximize our ability uh, and our maneuverability, which requ requires communication with all, and certainly with the major players. We're not there yet. The JCPOA would be an important step because the one major uh, uh, party that we're not on talking terms with are the Iranians, and they, are, um, they certainly have spoiler power uh, in the region. I think we need to make clear, very clearly, what our red lines are and what our red lines are not. Um, uh, I think signaling clearly that we're going to be leaving militarily entirely some of these countries would be important. So, for instance, my organization is coming out with a report tomorrow uh, for the anniversary of the Iraq war, in which uh, two of our uh, researchers who spent a lot of time in Iraq, Adam Weinstein and Steve Simon, are making the argument that we should put together a five-year plan for a full withdrawal from Iraq. Uh, we need to help the Iraqis uh, train their military to uh, prevent any resurgence of ISIS. ISIS is not as big of a problem in Iraq as it is in Syria, but we need to continue to train them. But we can't do this in an open-ended way as we did in Afghanistan. Because when we do it in an open-ended way, the Iraqis don't take it seriously. They just free ride uh, on the security that we're providing. 
we're not doing a proper job. And then we end up 20 years later still sitting there and they actually don't know how to defend their own country. In order to make sure that we actually truly train them so they can stand on their legs, on their own legs, we need to have a deadline for how long we're going to be staying there. I think those different types of measures. And then, of course, when it comes to conflicts in the region, adopt what the Chinese are doing today and what we used to do in the past, which is a neutral position and help resolve those conflicts and use our influence and, and raise our prestige by being a peacemaker rather than what we're doing right now, which is we entangle ourselves in those conflicts. We become co-belligerents. No one that I've spoken to in Washington can give me a compelling answer as to why the Houthis are a threat to the United States. I'm not saying the Houthis are good guys, but why are we involved in that war? And in fact, Obama administration officials who went into that war have come out clearly and said that we should not be in it any longer. Biden promised to get out, we're still in it. We're doing some things in the right direction there, but we shouldn't be there in the first place. And we have to have a much higher bar for when we get involved in these different conflicts. It should not be an easy decision for the United States to submit either its own troops or to end up supporting the war of another country uh, unless our own vital interests truly are at stake. If we pursue those policies, and it's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna change things in the immediate term, but if we do so over a longer period of time, I think we will end up in a much better position in the Middle East that will serve our interests, will also be uh, uh, beneficial for the region as a whole. But, but isn't there a problem in the region that Iran is still a revolutionary power that's still trying to spread its revolution and expand its own hegemony in the region? I mean, it's it's not a, it's not as if Iran is a, a docile player. It's a very active player. And we saw in the Arab Spring that they, they really made the difference in the outcome, certainly in Syria. And and they and and they they dominate Lebanon, and um, uh, and they dominate the Houthis basically, or they certainly affect them. I mean, it, how, I don't know if they dominate the Houthis, but I think you're absolutely right. First of all, yes, the Iranians are by no means a docile player. They're interfering, uh, uh, very interventionist states. Uh, I don't believe that they have an ability to establish hegemony. I think they can dominate certain countries. They certainly can dominate. Uh, uh, they have a dominant role in Lebanon. Uh, as did the Saudis up until recently. Um, but but let me take a step back and, and make two points. Um, uh, Matt Petty and I did a study two years ago. We looked at this question of the interference and the interventions of Middle East powers in the affairs of other Middle Eastern powers. We looked at every intervention in the Middle East by a Middle Eastern power between 2010 and 2020. And lo and behold, Iran is one of the most interventionist powers in the region, very destabilizing. But here's the surprise part. Two countries by 2015 had become more interventionist than Iran. One was Turkey and the other one was the UAE. If, if, this, uh, if we had conducted a study for another two years, I think actually the numbers would be even greater. The other problem in the um, uh, that the study revealed was that the top, the, the six main countries that were interfering were Israel, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Iran, Turkey, and the UAE. Well, guess what? Five out of those six are U.S. partners. Two of them are U.S. allies. All of them are flying American airplanes using Amer American military um, uh, and, and could not do most of what they're doing had it not been for U.S. support. And in many cases, they're fighting each other as the Emiratis and the Turks have been doing in Libya, for instance. So we are not faced with a region that is commonly viewed in Washington in which there is one player that is doing all of the interventions and is the root cause of all of these different problems. We're faced with a region in which a lot of countries are doing it, and some of them even more so than Iran has been doing. So to actually get to a solution to this, there needs to be a holistic approach that actually creates a new security architecture for the region. Because part of the reason why there's so much intervention here is because there's no commonly agreed upon rules of the game. That's very different from what you have in Europe and in many other regions of the world, including uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, the Middle East is one of the most um, uninstitutionalized regions in terms of, of security architecture. Now, part of the reason why we don't have a security architecture is because we were the security architecture. We were the military hegemon, so there was no need for it, that the argument essentially was. Now when we're not, we're seeing more of this instability, but we're also seeing efforts by the regional states 
to move away from that and, and resolve these issues through diplomacy. And that's a positive thing. We should encourage that. We should absolutely try to do our utmost to play a positive role in the region, finding its own security balance and architecture. We should not take the lead because it's their region. And for it to stand on its own legs, it needs to have a, 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 an internalization and buy-in from the region itself. And the more we have stepped back, the more we have actually encouraged them to step forward. But that doesn't mean that we should just throw up our hands and leave like that. There's still very positive things we can do, but we just have to stop thinking that everything we need to do needs to be led by the U.S. military rather than other sources and instruments of American influence. Well, that's quite a vision, um, and it and suggests something that's not there now, but maybe could could be brought in there. Um, I have a question from Mitch Gold, which goes in quite the opposite direction, which is, would a devastating military strike against the Iranian nuclear facilities topple the Ayatollahs? This is, I, I, this is, this is coming back to the use of force again, but it is yeah. a legitimate question. <laughs> No, it's a very important question. Uh, I find the likelihood of military strikes toppling the, um, the likelihood of it toppling the Ayatollahs compared to the likelihood of it actually solidifying their control be tilted overwhelmingly in the direction that it will solidify their control. In fact, I am worried that there are elements inside of the Iranian regime, knowing very well how little legitimacy they have left based on how they have conducted themselves, not only uh, in the last six months, but also over the last 40 years. And that they, the one way that perhaps they could gain some legitimacy is if there is an unprovoked, or at least a perceived unprovoked attack from the outside against Iran, in which they would be able to harness Iranian nationalism and get a rally around the flag uh, sentiment. This is to a certain extent what happened when Saddam Hussein invaded Iran in 1980, thinking that the country is in chaos and as a result would be an easy match. Instead, it really enabled Khomeini to uh, get people to rally around the flag, uh, uh, harness Iranian nationalism and solidify his control. So I think the likelihood of it doing exactly the opposite is, is far greater. That setting aside, are those strikes legal and all of these, uh, will it actually help prevent a nuclear bomb? Most uh, experts believe that if we actually conduct a military strike, mindful of the fact that there is, where the Iranians have gone way, way beyond a point in which you can actually bomb away their nuclear program. They know how to rebuild it. You would essentially not only have to kill all the nuclear scientists, you would have to burn all physics books in Iran in order to achieve that. We're past that point. So as a result, uh, a military strike would enable the Iranians to invoke Article 10 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, move out of that treaty, kick out all the inspectors, and uh, rebuild their program uh, without the insight of the international community, but with far greater commitment to actually build a nuclear weapon than what we've seen so far. So I think the risks are overwhelmingly on the negative side, whether it is non-proliferation, democratization, et cetera, than the benefits. So then the other question uh, comes back to China, and this is also about the militarization of American policy. Do you see an inevitable conflict with China in the next five to 10 years? <clears throat> or do we get caught up in a war in the Middle East due to China's influence? Um, I don't think the Chinese need to do much to uh, get us to start wars. Unfortunately, we have a tendency of doing that ourselves. Um, the word inevitable was used, and I think that's very critical. Do I find it likely that we may end up in some form of a military confrontation with China in the next five to 10 years? Unfortunately, I do. I think there is a significant risk. I mean, we are talking about war with China in a way in DC right now that is just would have been unthinkable just four or five years ago. So things have moved very quickly in a very negative direction in those terms. Is it inevitable? I don't, I don't believe that. I don't belong to the school of thought that thinks that we're, you know, China is a rising power. The United States used to be the superpower of the world. And as a result, there's no way to avoid such a confrontation. Either America dominates China or China dominates the United States. I don't buy into that. Um, I think there are, I think the biggest and most important challenge of this century will be to see how we can peacefully transition to a multipolar world in which the United States, most likely, if we play our cards right, will be the most powerful state in the world, but not the dominant power. China will be a major power. India will be a major power. 
You're seeing other states, Brazil and others, also raising not only uh, rising not only in terms of power but of uh, diplomatic heft and ambition. It's going to be a much more complicated world than it was for the last 25 years. If this is the greatest danger I see, if we think that we can stand in the way of these gravitational forces of geopolitics and reverse them, I think that will probably be the biggest mistake that we conduct, because I don't think you can win against gravity. I would never bet in, uh, in favor of anyone who declares war on gravity. These are forces that cannot be reversed. These are developments that we have to find ways to adjust, minimize the dangers and the risks and the negatives, and try to maximize the positive of them. But if we try to reverse it, I think we will exhaust ourselves far, far more than we did by occupying Afghanistan needlessly for 20 years. Uh, Trita, I have to say that I, I think there's been a really worthwhile conversation. I'm so glad that uh, you came on board uh, to talk with us. I think we've all learned a lot. I certainly uh, feel your suggestion about a security structure for the Middle East to be one of the most <laughs> valuable ideas out there, which I think nobody is pursuing right now, but maybe they'll take take the idea and run with it. Uh, if, if, you ha if you haven't written about it, I hope you will. Uh, uh, I, I have. Uh, I'll send it to you. You can share with your members. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you really, uh, and thanks our members for, for their questions. Uh, it's been a great evening, thanks, thanks again. Thank you so much, thank you for all the fantastic questions, really appreciate it.